with the third group in our capstone presentations today, and this uh, Fire 4 effect, or F4E, I don't know exactly where they came up with that, but uh, that, I don't know, it's somebody's background somewhere, I'm not so sure. But uh, this is, as I was mentioning earlier in the program, uh, the this is a combined effort between our uh, AE and ME groups because this airplane, this group designed the airplane and the engines for this airplane were designed by our ME propulsion track. So uh, without any further ado, fire for effect. Thank you, Dr. Ashworth. My name is Melissa Collins, and I'm the team lead for Fire for Effect. And this is our final design presentation for our close air support aircraft. Um, today, we will be, again, like I said, presenting our final design. And on my team is Matt Barnhouse, Kevin Clunin, Alex Drummond, Alex Mangum, James McClure, <laughs> Nick Bellaw, Cameron Wall, and Andre Winchell. Today we will be discussing um, various things as you can see on our screens. Um, above me we'll be referring to this as our primary screen, and to your guys' right is our secondary screen. Um, one of the things, first things that we're going to go over is the capstone course overview, to kind of show you guys where we're at on our capstone, and this has been a year-long project. And then we'll run through um, our winchell testing, both our initial testing and our um, secondary testing, and the analysis we got from that. For our capstone overview, um, like I said, this is a year-long project. We started in August um, with an AE420 preliminary design. These are our research and development phases of um, the first semester. And we went through, um, we analyzed what the motivation was for designing a CAS aircraft, in addition to what our RFP requirements were, the conceptual design, the preliminary design, and then the preliminary analysis on predictions for our aircraft. This semester we're doing um, the AE421. It's our detailed design, and it's the uh, test and evaluation phases of our project. So it includes the wind tunnel testing, the wind tunnel analysis, recommended modifications, testing again, and a structural analysis of the hammerhead. So for motivation, um, a CAS aircraft, there are there is a current CAS platform, it's the A-10. However, the Air Force is uh, actively looking to retire it, as well as it lacks maneuver or survivability in high threat environments. This means that it can't it has difficulty getting up and out of um, high threat situations. The F-35 has been a potential for the Air Force to replace the A-10. However, it cannot perform effectively at low speeds. It relies on high uh, altitude precision as opposed to close uh, range target support. And then the F-35 is an expensive aircraft with about a $98 million price tag at the engines. And now Cameron will discuss the um, RFP requirements in our next phase of research and development. Thank you, Melissa. So for our mission specifications, our aircraft had to be able to launch and recover from a runway on the land or an aircraft carrier. If operating from a runway, we could use no more than 8,000 feet for departure and landing. We had a maximum takeoff weight of no greater than 36,000 pounds and had, had to have the ability to cruise at Mach 0.8 at 30,000 feet. Uh, over on the secondary screen also, you'll see a typical mission profile for the Hammerhead. Uh, we were required to have a payload capacity of no less than 6,000 pounds of existing air service munitions along with a 20 millimeter cannon. We also had to have an appropriate cockpit design for high visibility. We were required to have a combat radius of no less than 200 nautical miles and the ability to spend at least 10 minutes on station, five minutes of which would be spent at five Gs with afterburner selected. We also had to sustain five Gs at 300 knots at sea level and perform a five G brake turn for five seconds at our cruising altitude. Over on the secondary screen, our range maps, uh, we determined that we would like to extend our RFP and put further restrictions on ourselves. We wanted to increase our combat radius to 250 nautical miles, which is shown on the secondary screen in theater. If we were operating from Intula, Turkey, or Mosul, Iraq, uh, with 250 nautical miles, we could reach the ISIS stronghold of Raqqa. We also decided that we wanted to sustain the 5G turn of our cruising altitude. So now I'll go into a brief aircraft description. The, on the primary screen are principal dimensions of the aircraft, and on the secondary screen is a preview of the aircraft. Also on the table here is, a, is our wind tunnel model of the Hammerhead. So as a basic description, the aircraft is a single pilot twin engine airplane. The engines were designed by the ME Capstone Propulsion Group, MTE. Uh, the airplane has a bubble canopy, internal and external weapons carriage capacity, uh, fuselage mounted M61 Vulcan, 
and a thrust weight of 1.2, again, thanks to MTP propulsion. Now, everything that you'll see from this point on in the presentation is all from the detail phase of our course. Next, Kevin Clooney will present the initial wind tunnel model. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, so, I'll go over a little bit of the CAD model development for the, the first phase of our wind tunnel testing. Um, and here's some of the, the primary screen, some of the limitations that we had in developing this model. We wanted to avoid wall effects and blockage in the wind tunnel uh, and restrict ourselves to a 40 pound uh, force limit on the balance and uh, structural and elastic effects. Uh, and over the course of these two semesters, we had a budget of $1,000. For the first phase of wind tunnel testing, we wanted to limit ourselves to $550. Uh, on the secondary screen, you'll see a, a model overview. Um, based on these limitations, we determined that the scale of our model is going to be a 132nd scale. And the configuration that we would test is uh, no external stores. Uh, we do have an internal payload bay that, that can carry payload. Um, and so we are not testing at our full weight with the external stores. Uh, however, minus 3,000 pounds of emissions that would have been on the external balloon. Uh, we also have flow through inlets, removal of wings and empennage, and uh, a structure, a substructure that allows us to be able to uh, change the model uh, very easily in the time. On the primary screen, you can see our dimensions. Um, and we printed out of ABS plastic here at Emory Riddle with 3D printers here. Uh, they have an accuracy of 0 0.01 inches, and uh, we tolerance all of our components in, the, in CAD um, for that. And we have an actual print section of 10 by 10 by 12 inches in the Z direction. Um, and again, as you can see on the front of the screen, uh, we would not fit in the uh, printing section, so we needed to print in multiple sections. Uh, again, on the primary screen, here's an exploded view of the wind tunnel model uh, to include the structural elements inserted into the mid fuselage section. And of note, the uh, rear has two components that can be inserted into uh, for removal and empennage surfaces testing. Uh, in the end, uh, we did print all the pieces and came in under our $550 budget for our first phase of wind tunnel testing at about $500. Uh, here's a view of the internal uh, structural components for the wind tunnel model. And uh, this, we had to actually buy some of these components, but uh, we were still under a $550 uh, Once we got all of our pieces printed, we finished them by applying primer and, and painting. And then we applied the tufts, uh, painted black and applied white tufts for uh, good contrast and pictures in the wind tunnel for flow visualization. So on the primary screen, uh, from here on out, I'm going to go through the assembly of the model. Uh, the primary screen will be the actual pictures, and then the secondary screen, you'll see the CAD rendering of, of these components. This is the structural component that allows us to uh, have the modular model for easy removal of the pieces that we wanted to take off during testing. Um, and here's just a, uh, a full exploded view of the actual model and the CAD model. So we start with the mid-fuselage, uh, insert the wing rods into the fuselage, um, and here you can see the actual printed plastic portion of the wing that goes into the fuselage. Uh, on the primary screen, you can see a really good view of that notch that's there, and that's a key component of holding our model together. Uh, once we have the wings in place, the uh, C-channel beam that has been fabricated uh, gets inserted in through the front of the, the mid-fuselage. And on the primary, or excuse me, on the secondary screen, you can see how those uh, that component interacts and interlocks those wings into place. Uh, once that beam is in, the, uh, the mounting bracket it's uh, inserted onto the bottom of the fuselage and screwed in place, and that secures the beam in place, locking the wings in place. And then once uh, once that's completed, we insert the front fuselage and screw that into the beam. And then the rear pieces, this is a good picture of how we printed those tabs that were uh, tolerance in the printer. Uh, make sure they fit correctly uh, before we move forward with it. And uh, they basically slide into the slots on the rear fuselage and can be removed 
very easily in the wings all the way to the testing. And unless the pieces are in place, the rear gets uh, screwed back onto the uh, beam in the center of the fuselage. And then this is just the final view of the fully assembled wind tunnel model, and this is ready to go be screwed into the mounting balance in the wind tunnel section. And Alex Mango is going to come talk to you about the wind tunnel and the testing. Thank you, Kevin. Now that we had our wind tunnel model, we were able to go into our first round of initial wind tunnel testing. To do this, the team utilized the AeroLab 87 wind tunnel located here in the Tracy Wonderland Wind Tunnel Lab on the Prescott campus. We utilized the AeroLab 6 software for data acquisition. We applied Tufts for flow visualization. And we utilized the pitot tube within the test section to measure flow velocity. On the secondary screen, you can see a close up of the test section with the direction of flow annotated by a callout, the, the pyramidal balance, and the point. Uh, that the moments were calculated about, also annotated by a callout. For our first round, we used four, configura four configurations initially for wind tunnel testing. The first was tear data to account for the force that the balance inputs on it, uh, itself. The second was the full aircraft, followed by the removal of the horizontal and vertical empennages. And the final test was removing the wings for fuselage test only. For structural verification to obviate the risk for damage to the wind tunnel, the team checked for the structural integrity of the aircraft by, by increasing the velocity within the wind tunnel. Let me back up. By first pitching the model to a positive 28 degrees, increasing the velocity into the wind tunnel until aeroelastic effects were seen in the model, and then making that our limit for further testing. This was roughly 115 feet per second and gave us a Reynolds number of around 200,000. For each config of the three model configurations, the aircraft was tested in alpha sweeps that ranged from negative 4 degrees to positive 28 degrees, and beta sweeps that ranged from 0 to negative 10 degrees, as indicated on the primary and secondary screens. After this first round of uh, wind tunnel testing, it was discovered that the incorrect CG location was inputted into the AeroLab 6 data acquisition software. The team attempted to uh, account for this by using statics and hand calculations to correct this information. And also, in the second round of wind tunnel testing, we put the model, the initial model, back into the wind tunnel and tested the full aircraft. It was determined that the data was too erroneous to use. And so from here on out, Alex Stroman is going to present the data from that initial wind tunnel test, from the second wind tunnel test with the initial model and only the full aircraft configuration. Alex. Thank you, Alex. So I just want to begin by reiterating that on the secondary screen, that's the model that you're going to be seeing the data for. And this was inputted with the correct CG locations. And that's the data you'll be seeing forward in this section. I also wanted to clarify that initially due to design phases, we had over-predicted lift. But the predictions you're about to see account for standard problems. So on the primary screen, you will see the lift curve. And on the secondary screen, you will see a table of important values. And then the highlights will change as we go through the section. Uh, the black line is the predicted, and then the blue line is the wind tunnel model data. Uh, excuse me. So, in regards to CL alpha, we had fairly close between the predicted and the wind tunnel model in terms of CL max. I think we uh, predicted slightly less than the wind tunnel model gave us, so about 0.98, and we got 1.07 out of the wind tunnel model. Uh, alpha stall had increased as well in regards to the wind tunnel model. We had predicted 13 degrees, and we got slightly higher at 14 degrees. Now on the primary screen, you will see flow visualization of the test at 15 degrees, so after the wings have stalled. And the red region indicates where flow uh, is separated over the wings, and this is because it is post-stall. And the blue region, you can see that the tufts are moving outwards, so this indicates that the flow is still attached to the fuselage. So this means our fuselage is still producing lift, and this gives us our nice stall regime uh, that you saw on our CL alpha curve. In regards to drag, the black line is again the predicted, and this accounts for parasitic pressure and induced drag, and how that changes with CL. And the wind tunnel model reflects the same parabolic curve, but it's significantly higher, an increase of around 200%. And if we zoom in closer to try and depict those uh, CD mins, we can see that we predicted a CD min of about 0.02, 
that we saw an increase to about 0.06 in our hotel. In regards to the pitching moment, we had predicted a stable aircraft in pitch, but the wind tunnel model did not entirely reflect this. It initially has a positive slope, uh, but after the wing stalls, we find a nice negative regime, and this is good because as the aircraft, or excuse me, as the wing stalls, we'll try and pitch the nose down, keeping the aircraft flying. And the static margin varies. We had predicted 5.4%, uh, but the wind tunnel model gave us around a slightly negative to negative one and a half percent. In regards to rolling data, Again, we had predicted a stable aircraft in roll, but the wind tunnel model did not reflect this and it gave us an unstable aircraft in roll. In regards to yaw moment, we had again predicted positively stable aircraft in yaw, and the wind tunnel model did reflect this, and our CN betas were very similar as well. Now, from that data, we were able to uh, find our performance data uh, for the wind tunnel model. Now, the black line is the wind tunnel model data, and then the gray dashed line is our predicted values. So again, with that increase in drag, we're finding that we're going to have a lot more thrust required uh, than we had initially predicted. And on the primary screen, that's sea level. On the secondary screen, that's 30,000 feet. And we can see that the predicted and wind tunnel model, both lines move out to the right, which is expected. Uh, and then also on the primary screen, we can find that our thrust available curves move down, which is again expected. The engine's not going to produce as much thrust at higher altitudes. Now from our thrust available thrust required, we were able to create specific excess power plots. And on the primary screen, you can see the predicted for military, so no afterburner selected, and a 1G maneuver. Now each increment is a 5,000 foot per minute increment, and the black lines indicate zero feet per minute on this graph. The highest on the primary screen indicates 20,000 feet per minute, and this allows an altitude of around 60,000 feet. Uh, but due to our increase in drag on the secondary screen, you can see our wind tunnel model data. And the highest line is only 10,000 feet per minute, and that allows operation at only around 15,000 feet. Now this is with maximum power, so with afterburner selected. And we predicted we could operate upwards of 55,000 feet per minute. But due to our increase in drag, we find that the wind tunnel model only reflected 30,000 feet per minute. Now, moving on to our 5G maneuvers. So this is with maximum power, so afterburner selected. And the two design points for, uh, relate to our RFP requirements, one being sustaining 5Gs at sea level, the other being the 5G brake turn at 30,000 feet. Now we had initially predicted we were able to sustain both maneuvers. But again, with our increase in drag, the wind tunnel model shows we can still sustain our 5G maneuver at sea level, uh, but we can only sustain 5Gs up to 29,500 feet. So we can't sustain it at 30,000, but we still may be able to perform the brake turn. Uh, on the primary screen, you will see a flight envelope for the predicted values. On the secondary screen, it again is our wind tunnel model. The limits for these is a positive 5.5 G and a negative 2 G limit. Uh, and the difference between the two, you can see that the corner velocity on the wind tunnel model is higher than predicted. And this is again to an increase in drag. We're going to have to fly at faster velocities to uh, maintain that corner velocity. Now, from this uh, data, we were able to conclude but the model produces significantly more drag than we had initially predicted. And this significantly affects our performance data, as you saw. Uh, we also found that we had produced more lift than we had predicted, but we still need more lift to, excuse me, to sustain the maneuvers. Uh, and we also found a slightly negative static margin, which isn't something we predicted. Now, on the secondary screen, you will see our recommended modifications, and those are in order of precedence. Uh, so to go through them, first is to add strakes, and this is to increase lift. Second is to thin the rear fuselage between the engines and taper that out to a point between the nozzles, and this will help reduce pressure drag at the back of the fuselage. Third is we wanted to move the vertical tails outboard, and this is largely due to structures. We wanted the vertical spar uh, of the vertical tail to be uh, within the fuselage, so not right above the engine cans. Uh, and then the fourth would be to increase the wingspan to help increase lift. Now the three highlighted are the ones that we actually implemented, and now Andre will discuss those further, continuing our detailed phase. Thank you, Alex. So for the modifications, we went with two modifications, the first being strakes, and the second being a modified rear fuselage. Uh, we implemented the strakes to increase the lift of the wind tunnel model, and we also uh, added the modified rear fuselage to, to decrease the drag due to separation and to increase the structure of the vertical tail. 
And on the primary screen, you'll see a table of the full-scale aircraft designed for the Straits. And then on the secondary screen, you'll see what the design looked like. We had a 72 uh, degree straight sweep, and then we had a 35, uh, 35 points, thir sorry, 39.6 inches span, and then 115 in length. For the Mach 5 review slides, it had two components as stated previously. We had the taper between the engines. This taper will extend past the engines to in between the nozzles. And then we also wanted to move the vertical tails of the Pat Ford as stated previously. And then on the secondary screen, you will see a uh, comparison between test model 1 and test model 2 of what the taper between the engines look like. Now for a more detail of the modified rear fuselage. Uh, the table would start at the aft end of the rear fuel tank. It would, uh, the thickness would be 10 inches at the end of the aircraft, and then the uh, vertical tails would be moved outboard of a total of 10 inches on the full scale aircraft. <coughs> and this was to increase the structure of the vertical tail. You see on the secondary screen, uh, test model one, the vertical tails are right on top of the engines, which, do, which inhibits us to allow, inhibits us to add structure there. But uh, moving it outboard, as you see in test model two, you're, uh, gives us more room to add structures in that area. And now, both on the primary and secondary screen are the Katir renderings of the final design. And then, both on the primary and secondary screen are what these uh, uh, renderings look like when they're implemented onto the wind tunnel model. You'll see on the primary screen, the, the strikes are visible above the inlets. And then, uh, at the aft end, you can see how the taper looks like, and you can compare these between the initial and the Mark V model. On the secondary screen, you'll be able to tell uh, the initial model where the vertical tails are, and then on the modified model, uh, how the vertical tails move outboard. And now for the fabrication of the mod modifications, uh, the primary screen is the fabricated model with the strakes and the tapered fuselage, and the secondary screen is uh, the Katir rendering of the model. So for the fabrication, we went through the same process that um, Kevin described to you earlier. We 3D printed them, sanded them, applied primer, applied the paint, third coat, and then uh, added the tusks. And as uh, Kevin stated earlier as well, uh, the aircraft is completely modular, so we were just able to print these pieces and then switch out the old pieces and have them on. And now for the second wind tunnel test. We tested four configurations. As uh, Alex and Adam uh, described you earlier, we uh, went with the initial wind tunnel model for retesting because the CGs were off, and these, uh, this data was described to you by Alex Drummond. And then we went with the initial model with straights only, then the initial model with the modified rear fuselage only, and then the model with both modifications. And then for the parameters tested, we did an alpha and beta sweep as well, from negative four to 28, and zero to negative 10. These parameters had to stay the same because we had to have a good comparison between the, uh, between the two models, and uh, just a valid comparison. And because of this, the velocity limit for the second wind tunnel test was the same as the first wind tunnel test. <coughs> and now, uh, Matt Barnhouse will describe Mark 5 model wind tunnel test. Thank you, Andre. Shown here on the primary screen is the lift data we generated from our second round of wind tunnel testing, showing each of the four configurations that Andre described. And then on the secondary screen is a table of some of the important parameters pulled from this data. We see that the modification with both the strakes and the modified rear fuselage uh, generated the most lift with the highest CO max and had the latest uh, alpha stall. These increases were very slight and not as expected would be uh, as expected they would be with the strakes modification. So it was determined that our strake modification would possibly need a redesign to generate the more lift that we were expecting. Now on the primary screen is a flow visualization image of the aircraft with both the strakes and the modified rear fuselage, slush, indicating that at the stalling of attack, the, when the wings are stalled, there is still attached flow over the fuselage, which again uh, is similar to the initial model that Alex described and corresponds to a relatively well-behaved stall behavior. Now on the primary screen is the drag puller for both, uh, all four configurations tested for the second round of wind tunnel testing. We found that the modified rear fuselage did in fact decrease our drag. And then on the next slide, we see a zoomed in view of that same drag puller, um, looking at the minimum drag point, showing the decrease in drag, the slight decrease in drag with the modified rear fuselage and the straight and modified rear fuselage design. 
Now on the primary screens are pitching moment data gathered from the second wind tunnel test. We see that the general trends amongst all four configurations are relatively similar, and this is expected as we did not propose any modifications to drastically change our stability data. We are looking to increase our lift and decrease our drag. But we see that all uh, four configurations are fairly neutrally stable, slightly negatively stable before stall, and then after stall they become positively stable as evidenced by the negative slopes. And for rolling moment data, similarly to the initial uh, wind tunnel model, we found that we are still unstable in roll in all configurations, as is expected since we did not propose any modifications to change this roll data. However, all configurations are very uh, similar in their roll characteristics. And then for y'all, we see that uh, the four configurations are even more similar to each other, and we did not make any major modifications to change y'all significantly, but we do see that all four configurations are stable in y'all, as evidenced by the positive slope. So looking at all of this data together, comparing each modification that we made, we decided that the applying both modifications, the straights and the modified rear fuselage, was the best move configuration to move forward with, as we did have a slight increase in lift and a slight decrease in drag. And now James will talk about our experimental performance data generated from this wind tunnel test data. Thank you, Matt. Now showing your primary screen is the, is the thrust available thrust required curves that Alex Garman showed you earlier for that initial wind tunnel model. On your secondary screen is the thrust available thrust required curves using the modified aircraft, so that includes the modified rear fuselage and the straight modifications. We use that drag data to generate thrust available thrust required plots. Now showing your primary screen is the thrust available thrust required for that initial wind tunnel model for 30,000 feet, and then on your secondary screen uses the drag data from the modified aircraft configuration to generate those thrust available thrust required curves, again at 30,000 feet. Showing your primary screen now is the specific excess power for 1G loading in military or non afterburning thrust. Again, initial model on your primary screen and on your secondary screen is for the modified aircraft. They both have a absolute ceiling right around 51,000 feet. For maximum thrust or afterburning thrust, the initial specific excess power that was shown to you before on your primary screen. On the secondary screen, we again see a maximum altitude of right around 63,000 feet and a maximum level curve of 30,000 feet per minute. For the 5G loading specific excess power with afterburning thrust on your secondary screen, we see that we are still capable of performing the sea level 300 knot sustained turn and just slightly, the uh, maximum altitude shown by the piece of rest curve for this modification is right around 28,500 feet. For the flight envelope, use, this used the lift data, the primary screen used the lift data from the initial model of the tunnel test, and the secondary screen used the modified model lift data to generate the stall lines for sea level 10, 20, and 30,000 feet. And now I'll present a comparison of the data that we generated from our tunnel test with the RFP and our, the requirements that we set up on ourselves. For the payload capacity, the RFP required that we carry 6,000 pounds of existing air service munitions. On your primary screen, shows a tier rendering of the aircraft loaded internally with six 500 pound bombs and externally with six 500 pound bombs mounted on external wind hard points. These bombs mounted externally were not present on the wind tunnel model. This rendering just simply shows that they are capable of being present on the full scale aircraft. The hammerhead is required to carry a M61 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon, which on our aircraft is mounted into the pilot's right hand side straight and the barrel of the guns extends just outside of the straight as shown on the primary screen. For range, the RFP required that we have a 200 nautical mile range and then F4E imposed an additional 50 nautical mile range to match the combat radius in the A10. The range that we ended up getting for the modified aircraft was right around 150 nautical miles and showing your primary screen is a comparison of what 150 model, nautical miles looks like in theater versus the 250 nautical miles presented earlier. Now shown on the primary screen is a rendering of the tail hook, which is located at the rear of the aircraft between the engines. The camera is required to be carrier capable to be able to take off and land on the Navy aircraft. It has landing gear that are designed to be capable of withstanding the impact loads of that controlled crash on the carrier deck, and then an arresting, arresting hook to catch the arresting gear to slow the aircraft to a stop on the carrier. 
for takeoff and landing requirements, the values that you see on your secondary screen correspond to the entire takeoff and landing and climb out over a 50 foot obstacle that as presented on the primary screen. Uh, so the CFR requires climbing a 50 foot obstacle and the spec also requires a climbing a 50 foot obstacle. So those distances were added on to just the ground roll that was initially calculated and resulted in values right around 3,2600 feet for takeoff and landing respectively. For the sea level 5G sustained turn, we are capable of performing it with afterburner. Initially our predicted uh, data stated that we could potentially perform this turn without an afterburner selected. However, given the drag rise that we saw from the predicted to the one tunnel model, we see that we need afterburner to perform this turn. For the uh, 30,000 foot Mach 0.8 sustained 5G turn, we saw that the predicted value stated that we could perform this turn at greater than 30,000 feet. And then after taking into account the wind tunnel data we got for CD min and induced drag parameter K, the uh, maximum altitude that we could perform this turn lowered itself to 20,500 feet. I would like to stress that this drag data included interference drag from amount in the wind tunnel test. And Nick Paul Wall will present the structural layout and analysis. Thank you, James. So to begin the structural uh, analysis, we've created VN diagrams to get the loading on the aircraft. We had two VN diagrams to consider our maximum weight and our design weight of the aircraft, where the design weight is when we're on station. So for our maximum weight, we had a maximum G limit of 5.5, a positive G limit, and a negative G limit of negative 2, where this is when we're in full loaded conditions. And the structural limit on the right hand side is not, or on the primary screen on the right hand of the plot, is a structural dive limit from the mill specs, not the aerodynamic limit. So for our on station VN diagram, we had a G limit of 7.5 specified by the mill specs and a negative G limit of negative 3. And again, the structural limit is a structural dive limit from the mill specs. And that was the most constraining one, is was our on station VN diagram. So we took the maximum G limit from the mill, from the VN diagram, multiplied by that by a factor of safety of 1.5 to get our 11 and a quarter G limit loading. From there, we multiplied that by the weight of the aircraft to get the total loading on the aircraft, and then multiplied by the percentage of lift generated by the wing and stall during our wind tunnel test, divided that by two, and got the total loading on each wing, which was 125,000 pounds. Uh, so for our model, we created a simplified structure, uh, which is shown on the primary screen. This structure does not include the skin in front of the leading edge spar or behind the trailing edge spar and all of the skin pieces on the spars are flat plates. So we took this simplified structural model, we put it in ANSYS, and we applied the loading onto the wing of the ANSYS, and then we calculated the stress as well as a stress factor, which was the ultimate uh, strength of the material, divided by the applied stress on the material. So the maximum stress we experienced in the wing was 67,000 PSI, where we had a maximum tip deflection, or a maximum deflection which was at the tip of the wing, 4.6 inches, and the wing experienced 69% applied stress of the ultimate stress. So we did the same process for the horizontal tail. We, except instead of 73% of the load, the horizontal tail only carried 12% of the load from the wind tunnel testing. And then we applied a uh, elliptical lift distribution and tapered lift distribution, average the two to get a strengths approximation, which is the loading that we applied onto the structure. And again, we simplified the horizontal tail structure um, to the structure shown on the primary screen, where we cut off the skin in front of the leading edge bar and behind the trailing edge bar, and then we made the skin between the spars flat plates. So here's the ANSYS model of our uh, horizontal tail loaded in the same way as the wing and we had a maximum stress of 39,000 psi, a maximum deflection of 0.8 and a total percentage of ultimate strength or ultimate stress of 
So for the fuselage structure and the vertical tail structure, we did not apply uh, stress analysis or strength analysis. Uh, this primarily because we did not have a loading analysis that we could apply to these. Um, so on the primary screen is the vertical fuselage structure, and on the secondary screen is the vertical tail structure. So for our structural conclusion, our wing and tail structures were over-designed. They had experienced much less than the ultimate stress when they're at their ultimate loading. Um, the effects of this are going to be that the airframe lasts longer, which and that it, they're more resistant to damage, such as carrier landings. Um, but for our final flight test article, we would uh, recommend that the weight or the the structure be optimized to decrease the total weight of the aircraft, even though we are still within our weight limitation. And now, Melissa Kong will describe the aircraft cost estimation. Thank you, Nick. So one of the analysis we did was um, an estimation of how many aircraft um, the Hammerhead would want to produce in our first round of production. So we based this off of the current fleet of the that the Department of Defense currently has at its disposal. And we assumed that we would replace all of the A-10 aircraft and then a portion of the F-15, the F-16, and the F-18 aircraft that we uh, estimated to be uh, performing the cast role. And these, uh, the current fleet was based on 2015 numbers. This brings our total for the hammerhead to about 710 aircraft. We took this number and we applied it to a cost analysis um, with our research and development numbers. and we made a prediction of about $76 million per hammerhead. Um, this is less than the F-35, which is $98 million without the engine, so we need the ability to have a less expensive aircraft that's able to perform a cast mission. As for labor and costs for the team, um, on the primary screen is a breakdown of the number of hours put in over the course of the semester. It was predicted that for every hour in class, the team would spend two hours outside of class. And this number is as of this last Sunday, um, when we calculate all the hours at the end of the week. So currently the team has put in about 1,600 hours. If we break the numbers down into categories, on the primary screen is the hour breakdown into the five different categories. We're dominated by engineering and professional development. And then on the secondary screen is the cost based on the number of hours put into each category. As for conclusions and recommendations, um, the conclusions we came up with were that we would like uh, that with both modifications, so with the strengths and the modified rear fuselage, we're producing 3.6% more lift from our initial wind tunnel test. However, we still need more lift, um, and then the strengths did not perform according to what we predicted as Matt stated during his presentation. We also found that we were producing 3.8% less drag with both modifications, um, but again, we still need less drag. And then, as Nick stated, we have structurally over-designed our internal structures. Which brings us to our recommendations. We recommend to move forward with um, keeping the strength modification for the first flight test article. However, we would like to do further research into modifying the strength design into a more conventional strength design um, in the attempt to increase lift from the strakes. We would also propose to keep the modified rear fuselage for the first flight test article, but researching further aerodynamic improvements to the rear fuselage to further decrease drag, and then as the stated, to optimize the internal structural design of the hammerhead. Any questions?
look back at the 117 first flight vertical tails and then the second flight vertical tails, very different. All because of wind tunnel data. So, something to keep in mind. Um, what penalty did you pay for uh, weight for making a carrier capable? Um, it increased the weight of our landing gear, um, but it was, we knew going, starting the process that we would have to be carrier capable. So when we were doing a weight and balance estimate at the beginning of pre design, um, we accounted for the fact that we'd have to have the gear. Okay. Gear and structure, yeah. is it all that listed in somewhere? No, but you don't have a percentage that you can throw out there. Not off top of it. All right. Um, and then there was comments about static margin, getting static margin out of the wind tunnel. You don't. You get aerodynamic center out of the wind tunnel. Because static margin is based on the difference between CG and aerodynamic center. So be careful about that. Because I think what you really were trying to do is move the aerodynamic center around more than you're trying to move static margin. Because you can change your CG by re-equipping the airplane with a different layout of internal structure and avionics. So something to think about. You guys did a great job. Um, you fall into one trap that every engineering group falls into every single time, is that you try to develop something that the customer didn't ask for. They wanted a 200 nautical mile range, you went for 250 nautical mile range. Please remember that when you get into industry, when, you, when your customer gives you an RFP, they're asking for something for a reason. And if you're going to give them a Cadillac, you're going to pay a penalty for it. And I think you guys saw that in the end. You see that you're not even making the nautical mile range that you wanted to get because you had beefier structures, so you over-designed your aircraft to try to get some things that were ever requested. And with that will come along additional cost. So just be careful about that. It's it's you, you always want to give them something that they haven't asked for, but you would take the penalty in the weight by doing the carrier and the ground launch to begin with. So, but great job on everything that you presented, but I just caution against that, you know, as you go out to the workplace, good ideas sound great, but your customers ask for something for a very specific reason. Good job, guys. Um, similar question I asked the first group is, how did you account for a red ounce of correction, particularly when we have a discussion on drag being too high and lift being too low? I'll hand that off to our wind tunnel test sub team lead, James B. Clare, to answer the question. Thank you, Melissa. Um, when we initially looked at some of the data we were thinking about round number corrections, we did some research as part of the test group, we went online, looked through papers on round number corrections specifically for wind tunnel data. Uh, we found one actually that was presented by and published by a, a professor here locally. So we went up and talked to him about some of the methods surrounding it and that he would have some uh, insight. And basically what he mentioned is the fact that the rounds that would be tested out was around 200,000, give or take a few thousand. Um, <laughs> close enough. Close enough, exactly. um, and the round number that we cruise at is right around 32 million. So trying to extrapolate data from a low round number such as 200,000 up to even our takeoff round number was too wide of a gap to attempt to get accurate data and then present that with validity. So instead we decided to go with a conservative estimate with the direct move forward with that. Well, I definitely appreciate the research on the answer. That was good. Um, drag corrections for, for Reynolds and Reflex out of tunnel data is something that befalls the majority of people who do that for real. There are entire drag workshops for people trying to do drag predictions. It's an incredibly difficult topic. Don't feel bad about not having a perfect answer there. Uh, why? Talk to me about the decision to go with a flow through nacelle on something that has a rather lengthy duct on a small level like that. I will pass that off to the propulsion slash structures that fell off. Um, so for the propulsion um, or for the flow through inlets, we decided to go with them because if our engine ever turns off or if it's just windmilling in flight, that would be the closest approximation to it. And instead of just having a flat plate there to close off the inlet, we would this would be a more representative of our model, of the actual flight test article. Okay. I'm glad to see you give it some thought. I, I worked on a fairly similar airplane a long time ago, my first one long experience. And, uh, we didn't go with a flat plate either. We actually put a bulleted nose on it to close it out. Uh, that introduces a whole host of other problems to try and figure out how to correct it out. And it's, it's always a kind of a mess, but I'm glad to see that there was a little bit of thought put into it. Uh, last question for me, and it's kind of a two-parter though. Uh, 
how did your performance information that you presented later take into account the stores that you don't have addressed on the model? So the reasoning for not including the external stores on our model was such that we didn't, because we had to be able to carry any configuration of existing air ground munitions, we didn't want to limit ourselves to um, a specific configuration um, for the external stores. Um, so the that was the thought process going into the testing as to why we didn't have external stores. And then the drag that, <coughs> that would be present with external stores, um, we did not include in our drag calculations for the presented data. So the obvious downside of that is you ended up with a very unconservative answer because you hang six pylons and six things of stores off there and whatever the largest ones are, that's going to give you your draggiest configuration. So it's going to hurt everything that you have presented here even further. Um, what would a test, a tunnel test specifically program look like for stores integration? I will again hand that off to myself. <laughs> to <you. laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> so I don't have a, a ton of experience with tunnel testing, but the job I'm going to is, to, is for flight testing. It's about UAB, so. It would be relatively similar. Right. Um, so for a tunnel test, we'd like to uh, think of the scale, because at this scale, the interference effects are um, not trying to scale up to a full scale model. So if we were to try and get an accurate depiction of what the interference drag from stores would be, we'd probably want to build a large scale model of the, of the wing, if not the, uh, the entire aircraft and body effects as well, and then mount um, the same size or dummy munitions to see the effects and then run the tunnel at it various velocities to get um, drag differences for a clean, uh, clean wing, a uh, clean, uh, wing with pylons, a uh, wing with stores. Perfect. And then you're going to go through and iterate on each of the store configurations that you expect to allow on flight. Exactly. So that you can check out not just drag stuff, but asymmetric stores. So if you push one off of the outboard pylon on the left wing, or you get to be able to control the finger actually. Something like that. Good job, guys. All right, just a couple questions to finish up. The first thing I guess I'll touch on is uh, I liked a lot of your guys' slides, the way they were presented, um, the way the tables were shown. I think you kept one table the same for a while, kind of highlighted through it. That was great, very easy for me to follow because there's a lot of data you guys are showing us. So sometimes we confuse ourselves uh, looking through the charts. So thank you for that. Um, I liked how when you got to the structures portion, you gave me a rundown on how you came up with the loadings if it was ultimate or limited, and that's that's more of what we like to see as opposed to an FEA result. Because you could slap that on the screen, and it could be a really really bad model, or it could be a really good model. But I had no idea because you didn't tell me how it was loaded, um, and what assumptions you guys made in that model. So good job on that. Um, I think for the capabilities and, and what is taught here at the level, that was very well executed. Um, when you get out and learn more, you'll we'll kind of find some other places where we'd like to see more information. So a couple easy questions for you guys. On the wing and the, I think it was the horizontal tail, there's 126,000 pounds going through the wing. There's 20,000 pounds going through the tail. So can you tell me what the depth of the roots were on each of those structures? I'll hand that off to our structures, please. So what I'm getting at here is, um, when, especially when we start laying out the aircraft, is that um, once you know these high level loads of, hey, I have this, this much shear going through my wing, and arrow says I only have an 8 inch depth, um, you can very quickly tell if that's possible or not. Um, and by what I mean is, uh, you, we can throw as much metal at it as we want, but sometimes the, we can't throw enough aspect in there. So, um, do you know those numbers? I want to say it's about 12 inches, but. For the wing? For the wing. Okay. Um, for the tail, I want to say it was about eight inches. Okay. So those those are good numbers for your sake. Uh, they work out well um, when it comes to attaching fasteners. Uh, recently, I've been working on a problem where we have a lot more load going through a lot less area, a lot less height. So our challenge is, uh, what kind, what does this joint look like? So um, I think that was everything I had. So good job. Uh, you said the vehicle had to have survivability. What did you do to make it survivable? Um, one of our main features was we made a bubble canopy. Um, 
so that the pilot has a more aware or a higher awareness of his surroundings. It just makes it more. It just makes it easier for him to be hit. Okay. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we also it took into account for survivability, um, we attributed to MT propulsion when they de uh, designed our engines um, with a high thrust to weight ratio that allows us to be able to get up and get out in high threat environments. So survivability to me means something very different. There's a book by Robert Ball about survivability. And so the A10 has those engines, so if you hit one, it won't frag the other. You can now put your two engines very close to each other. So single pull-up in one engine you can actually just put the other engine. So there's a lot of things you have to do. So there's a whole lot of kill chain. And so you want to go through each piece part of this and say, you know, I'm going to reduce the ability to be seen. So I'm going to paint my airplane black, gray, what am I going to do? So I didn't see anything addressing survivability. And as a pilot, I would have thought he would have been helping you go down. <laughs> <laughs> the bubble canopy is great because then you can see, but you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> it was coming from the front. <laughs> I do have one other thing, though. So, if you go back just one slide, there's something about that one that really, really scares me. And I recall whenever we first let them put AIM 9s on the A-10, the A-10 thought, the drivers thought, oh, now we're an air-to-air -air fighter. So then they tried to engage us as the air-to-air -air resources, and it didn't take them long to figure out that, oops, we're going to die. <laughs> but if you put AIM 9s on there, they're going to think that, so you're going to have less airplanes coming back home because they think, oh, well, we can engage these guys too. And, uh, well, sorry, but they killed us. Good job, guys. Thank you.